Hello and welcome back. I'm Dr. Mark D. Baldwin and today's lecture is on Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson domesticated philosophy, bringing it down to earth and making it accessible to the common man. Making generous use of analogies, Emerson can be very hyperbolic, claiming grand visions. One of Emerson's primary influences was the British philosopher and writer Thomas Carlyle, who wrote of man's need to celebrate the wonder of nature and that any object is a symbol of God and can serve as a window to infinitude with the right point of view. What is life but the angle of vision, asked Carlyle. Like Carlyle, Emerson felt that the problems we face are not in the world itself, but in man's manner of regarding the world. Emerson is a romantic, in that he's forever pursuing the unattainable reconciliation of those disparate opposites. A neoplatonic idealism versus a hard-boiled, homegrown American realism. Please see my lecture on Romanticism for many more details on that subject. Emerson is also a transcendentalist. Please see my lecture on that subject. Emerson believed in the principle of organicism, seeking the marriage of thought and things, seeing a doubleness in the importance of particulars to illustrate general truths. He used images of physical things as metaphors of spiritual profundities. Much like Melville's Moby Dick, William Wordsworth's Lakes, or Mark Twain's Mississippi River, Emerson's images relate to unseen spiritual forces or sources. This belief is derived from Samuel Taylor Coleridge's belief that a literary work grows from a seed, a germinal idea, and what makes it grow is a miraculous spiritual energy. Emerson saw no basic hostilities in nature and no radical evil in man. Thus, he was to some degree at least a pantheist. He believed that there is a godlike force in nature and that the external world reflects an invisible inner reality. Emerson wanted to express himself as nature worked, not consciously by design, but naturally, organically. Emerson was a witness, giving testimony about the source and force of pantheism. He was led to this belief primarily as a reaction against what he saw as rampant materialism and commercialism. Emerson also relished what he called the sublime. Not just the pretty or picturesque, but those things and ideas and moments that bring with them a feeling of extreme awe. He wished to be struck dumb by witnessing the spiritual in the material, often through a correspondence with nature. In fact, this is one of Emerson's doctrines, the doctrine of correspondence, that the whole natural world corresponds to the spiritual world. Furthermore, Emerson believed in an oversoul, a universal collective unconscious, an inner light or animating force where what is me and what is not me are joined. All of nature, including the body, is not me. Only the soul is me. This is the equivalent of Wordsworth's spots of time, in which we transcend this world and become one with nature. Nature is the title of Emerson's Manifesto, a rhapsodic prose poem that asks the essential question, what is the purpose of nature? Replete with the American themes of egalitarianism, self-reliance, and individualism, nature posits that words are signs of natural facts. Every natural fact is a symbol of some spiritual fact, and the whole of nature is a metaphor of the human mind. Throughout all of nature, Emerson stresses this correspondence between visible things and human thoughts, noting how words operate as symbols and that man can corrupt the language and pervert the meanings of words. 
The whole world, in fact, is emblematic, and the whole of nature is a metaphor. Thus, man must be disciplined to understand the spiritual truths and to build his own world out of the pure idea in his mind. When he does that, when he marries matter and mind, he will enjoy an influx of the spirit and begin to see things in great proportions. For Emerson, seeing things with a transparent eyeball allows man to experience life and existence with a sense of wonder. Remember, the American writer, unlike writers just about anywhere else, had little history or traditions to work with. So much was brand new and too big to comprehend about the country and the continent. Thus, awe and wonder were the order of the thinking man's day. In fact, Emerson issued a challenge to all scholars and would-be scholars to see themselves as man-thinking. In the American scholar, Emerson contends that the sublime doctrines posit that there is one man, yet society forces its members to specialize so that they've suffered amputation, having become metamorphosed into a thing. Thus, Society has divided an otherwise unified nature by seeing people as things, valuable only in a material sense. Another of Emerson's masterpieces, Self-Reliance, stresses the connection between the self and godlike nature. Emerson encourages us to accept the place the divine providence has found for us, because our self-existence is the attribute of the supreme cause. As a finite individual part of an infinite collective whole, we are one with organic nature, and our soul becomes. Once we recognize and accept that the man is at one with God, then we can become our individual selves, something we must do, for imitation is suicide. This essay overflows with Emerson's faith in the individual who recognizes his correspondence to the over-soul and employs his intuition in his quest to see truly. According to Emerson, you must be a nonconformist, speak the rude truth, and hold sacred the integrity of your own mind. Individuals can and must detach themselves from men who measure their self-esteem of each other by what each has and not by what each is. The self-reliant individual must shun the materialism of society, for nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. Here are some more brilliant lines and thought-provoking concepts from self-reliance. Society everywhere is in a conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. Trust thyself. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. To be great is to be misunderstood. Traveling is a fool's paradise. An intellectual liberator... Emerson has been an enormous influence on American thought, politics, and society. However, as some of the preceding quotes suggest, the Emersonian individual must be fairly well-balanced, well-educated, and well-meaning. For those people who are not, his philosophies can easily be faulted for their overly optimistic, idealistic, and visionary nature. Thanks for your attention, and I'll see you next time.